American Airman. I am a warrior. I have answered my nation's call. I am an American Airman. My mission is to fly, fight, and win. I am an American Airman, wingman, leader, warrior. I will never leave an Airman behind. I will never falter, and I will not fail. It's easy to hit that double drum. All right, welcome back, everybody. It's the Air Force's only live stream from recruiting service. That's the back and forth. Uh, so welcome to 24, right? This will be our first show of 2024, first show of January. And uh, as you can tell, new year, new look. The studio background looking pretty cool. Um, got a polo on. This is pretty sweet. Uh, today we're going to talk all things security forces. That's going to be law enforcement or police officers uh, on the civilian side. Uh, we call them defenders. And if you've ever wondered what it's like to make that translation from the civilian side into the Air Force while also carrying with you like that law enforcement capability or even having a career in the Air Force as law enforcement and then being able to learn and acquire skills that you can translate back to the civilian side in almost like a one to one kind of way. Uh, this is the show for you. You definitely want to stick around. We've got some guests that we're going to introduce later in the show and we're going to have all kinds of questions for them. Uh, they're going to bring a wealth of knowledge, and they're going to help us get to the bottom of what it's like to be a security forces member or a defender in the Air Force. So keep those questions coming in. Uh, you guys know where to put them in the chat. Put a queue before them like we just saw at the bottom of the screen. Um, and for the recruiting questions, we've actually got people in the chat right now that will be answering your questions uh, live uh, from their keyboards, and then we're going to handle all the stuff on the show about security forces. So if you've got security forces specific stuff, that's where we're going to answer that stuff here. We'll pull them up on screen like we always do. Um, but yeah, we're looking forward to an awesome show. And to get things kicked off, we have got an awesome video that's going to do a pretty good job of explaining a little bit about the defenders and security forces in the Air Force. Let's hit it. <laughs> Security Forces is the first line of defense on each Air Force base. We're the first and last people you see when you enter and leave a base. It's our duty to keep every person and every asset safe and secure. We do whatever it takes to ensure emergencies don't arise. But if they do, we respond swiftly. As defenders, we are the people others turn to for help. Security Forces is very different from an everyday police career. Because the Air Force has its own set of unique missions, there are a lot more opportunities to explore, from training all over the world to specializing in a variety of roles. You can be a combat arms instructor and teach the base populace how to employ weapons accurately and in what scenarios. You can be part of flyaway missions and guard airplanes all over the world. You can also be a military working dog handler and employ a canine throughout the base for different operations. There's not one type of person who would make an ideal defender. It takes many different personalities in all walks of life to make security forces as strong as it can be. But it can be a demanding job and you have to be ready. You go through rigorous training, so you have to be mentally and physically fit. It could be your fifth year or your fifth day where being a defender puts you in a position to become a leader. It'll break you out of your shell and help you find that confidence you never knew you had. Being a defender in the Air Force is something you should be proud of. You are making a difference with each and everything you do. You put the beret on, you put your gear on to protect and defend each and every base. And earning your beret is a symbol of that. It's a huge accomplishment, not just in someone's career, but in their life. Ooh, I got goosebumps from that one. That's really cool. I love the end shots where the guys are putting on the beret and the girls are putting on the beret. It's really sweet. Okay, so let's get into all the questions. Let's get into the rest of the show. Uh, we have got, uh, let's see, Chief Master Sergeant Gallagher uh, is going to be joining us here. There you are, sir. Um, help me understand what it's like to be uh, security forces. And I know that video shows a ton of what we would see as that law enforcement aspect. Lots of lights, um, lots of uh, police cars and stuff like that. But I understand there's so many more versions of uh, what it's like to be a defender once you're inside security forces. So welcome to the show. Thank you, Sergeant <laughs> Hey, 
Thanks for that question. You get me excited too. Hey, let me tell you, we are probably the absolutely most diverse career field in the United States Air Force. Uh, that just that just scratches the surface of the things that we do. Uh, we've got so many different mission sets that we do, everything from flyaway security missions that was mentioned in the video. We have base defense groups that do inside and outside the wire security downrange, protect our resources, our aircraft and our personnel that's in harm's way. Uh, we do things that are just unimaginable some. You know, we've got the 820th Base Defense Group, which works much like an infantry battalion does, securing our base perimeters. Uh, it, it is just so far and wide. We have investigations. We have law enforcement. You mentioned K-9. Combat arms, which is like a firearms instructor to all of you out there in the world. Uh, there's just so many things, and each base has got a diverse, different mission based on the mission set that they have, the aircraft they protect, and the power that they project from those bases. Uh, but overall, there's just so many different things you can do. I don't think you can find another career field in the Air Force uh, that is diverse and has so many different things you can do worldwide at a moment's notice that you never dreamt you could do. Yeah, I understand there's a ton of different avenues that you can pursue once you're in. Um, and that kind of gives a lot of um, kind of a personal touch and a lot of customization. So if somebody has a specific skill set that they want to chase down, um, whether that's that nuclear mission or whether that's military, you know, the working dog handlers and, you know, or being a raven or being um, an arms instructor, those are those are diversely different career fields with totally different skill sets required to operate and perform them successfully. Um, what's it like from what you've seen from the young men and women joining that have that knowledge of that they want to be security forces and then they get in and they find out about all this opportunity? What do you see in there? What I see is opportunity. You just hit it, right? So we just kicked off uh, probably the biggest paradigm shift in security forces training in the last probably 30 years. So now when you join up, you're going to go through the basic defender course, and it is going to teach you the absolute basics. Because at the end of the day, for all the mission sets that we have, I need you to be brilliant at the basics. That means shooting, moving, communicating, being able to do mounted patrols, dismounted patrols, and perimeter defense. And you master those things in 13 weeks of your, your uh, basic defender course before we set you out into the world. And you're going to go learn that specialized mission set at the particular base that you go to, whether that's nuclear security for Air Force Global Strike Command, or if it's doing Raven missions for AMC. Uh, the theme here is opportunities. There's so many opportunities. And the only limiting factor is yourself. If you want to go somewhere and you want to have an amazing career, you will. But you've got to seek out those opportunities. And there's so many different ones to have. You know, a lot of people, a third of our defenders are going to go to Global Strike Command. That is the nuclear enterprise. OK, that is a nuclear deterrent from the national uh, security strategy that we take great pride in. The United States Air Force owns two thirds of the nuclear triad. And we're going to put you into positions where you'll have the opportunity, members of the Tactical Response Force, uh, nuclear tactical um, recapture and recovery, convoy operations actually moving nukes through the complex, uh, base security, um, you name it. All those things are there. You're going to hear me, you've already heard me talk about diversity. The only limiting factor is yourself. Like I once said, you just have to be engaged. You've got to bring some get to itness, and you got to listen to the people that are there with you to set you up for success. Uh, once again, so many things to do. It's literally up to you. Yeah. Well, some of the things that you're using to describe the career field and some of the opportunities there, uh, I can tell that that comes with some built-in training that has that get as you said. Uh, really just motivation, uh, the push to become the best you can be at something and then take that to your job in the best way you know how to. So I'm gonna kind of kick back to what you said. Uh, you said a big paradigm shift, first time in 30 years. Uh, and that kind of makes me uh, push a little farther than that. Um, you know, tell me about the history of security forces. Where did it come from? Where did it start? Um, you know, and, and tell me about the origin. Yeah, I know. Absolutely. So we were, we were born from the United States Army in 1947, which many of you already know that. So when we first started life in the United States Air Force, we actually came across as military police. A few short years later, we wanted our own identity. So we became air police. Uh, we did the base security mission, mostly law enforcement and things of that nature. Uh, 1966, we found ourselves in the Vietnam conflict, and with that came a name change. We became known as security police and would remain that until 1997. And in 1997, that would find us uh, 
merging the law enforcement specialties, the security specialties, and we would have K-9 and combat arms. Combat arms actually belonged to the base populace. We pulled them with us to specialize, and that was after the bombing of Cobar Towers. And then, as most of you know, uh, 9-11 happened. Uh, that put us in the Middle East to encounter insurgency warfare for probably the next arguably 20 years. Uh, we're still in some of those locations. We're still getting after that mission. But the one thing that sticks out is about every 20 years, something happens, some trigger point happens uh, that changes our identity and changes how we get after warfare and changes our mission set. So we will always have that piece of the law enforcement, but that is really just our getting in point. Uh, whenever you come in that uh, installation entry control point, the first person you're going to see is the defender, and they're going to be indicated by wearing that blue beret proudly and greeting that installation. That is our first line of defense to determine who needs to be there and who doesn't need to be on that installation. And we build from there. Yep. History is a proud one. Uh, we're at a paradigm shift for the United States Air Force. I I'm proud today to be in the General Jacob Smart Center at Andrews Air Force Base, where uh, we are greeting all of our brand new Defender Chief Master Sergeants that just got promoted. But right down the hallway, the United States Air Force is meeting to determine what we will look like in the near future to fight near peer and peer peer competitors. So we are ready to change again. We've been working for the last 36 months to really regain our focus on what base defense looks like. And we're really, really sharpening our tactical edge to get after that. So once again, law enforcement is a piece of that, but we're gonna hone all those shoot, move and communicate skills to get after the mission to come. Gotcha. Well, can you give us a little, I've got a couple of questions for you personally, um, but you kind of hit something there. Can you give us any sneak peeks on what's to come? What's the, what's the future of security forces look like right now? Hey, you know what? I would love to let you in on that secret. I, I wish I could be outside the door with a glass to it to figure out what they're talking about. Uh, I just think uh, if anyone's out there uh, familiar with the agile combat employment concept, uh, we're going to get back to learning how to operate in small, small teams uh, to fight in a contested environment. We've had the luxury of time and power projection platforms to get after our competitors uh, and enemies of the past. Uh, I think that the days of that luxury being available to us are very limited uh, from a strategic point of view. No near peer or peer peer enemy is gonna let us set up shop across their border. Uh, so we've got to become more agile. Uh, we've got to become more dependent on our staff sergeants, tech sergeants and middle tier leaders to get after this. Um, I know the way the Air Force wants to fight. I don't quite know how we're going to look as we fight that fight. And I think that's what a lot of us here today are wondering what's going on down the hallway. I'm excited at what they're going to say and what they're going to come up with. Uh, but I'll bet we won't hear anything until the Air Force Association Conference coming up here shortly. Understood. I had, to, I had to ask just in case there was a little bit, you know, a little bit of secret sauce flowing around and figure out what's going on down the hallway because there are some important conversations happening there. So, um, so yeah, I got a question for you. I see uh, on your chest there, you got a couple different colors for those uh, job badges. Uh, black is not an Air Force one. So tell me a little bit about that. What's your background? Well, so black is not an Air Force one. You'll see a lot of them because we send a lot of our personnel to Army schools. So uh, my career path doesn't look like most people's career paths looks. I spent 14 years in the United States Army as a senior NCO when I was all said and done before I crossed over to the Air Force in 2003. Uh, I started life as a military policeman. That's how I ended up in security forces eventually. I also cross-trained infantry so I could go to some of these schools that you know you see on my chest uh, for jobs that I was able to do there. And, and I was lucky enough to, to get to go to airborne school and air assault school and sniper school and do some of the things that the Army would ask me to do. Uh, later, I would cross train as a cavalry scout. Uh, but at the end of the day, my heart always was, how do I get to the United States Air Force? They were my first choice. They just didn't have anything open when Donnie Gallagher was in high school, getting ready to get out of high school, needing a plan to move forward. So in 2003, I crossed over, crossed into the blue, and uh, wow, uh, the world took off for me there. I, I have zero regrets. It was interesting to go from an E7 one week to an E5 sergeant the next week, probably the oldest fire team leader in the Air Force in 2003. Uh, but nobody tricked me. Everything paid off. Uh, quality of life has been outstanding. And, and I can literally look you in the eye and say, I have loved every minute of what I've done in my career. It's been very rewarding. I wouldn't change a thing. Uh, and I've been in uniform for quite some time. Uh, but I need the next Donnie Gallagher's out there to step up and come and relieve me when my time is done. Understood. I like that. Very well said. Um, so I kind of want to get into some also some stories from you. Give us some kind of some examples of 
uh, some of your prouder moments uh, while you've been serving, whether it was in the Army or, you know, after you had that that light bulb moment and decided that the Air Force was the way for you to go. Um, but I do want to give a shout out to everybody out there that's joining us online right now. Make sure you're throwing your questions up in the comments. We are stockpiling them right now. We see them coming through. And uh, once we're done with a couple more questions with our guests, we're going to jump into those questions and we'll be able to put those up on the screen and get them answered for you. So make sure to put a cue in front of it uh, if it is a question. And if it's just throwing out some love or throwing a comment for this comment section, keep them, keep them coming. We'd love to see it. So, um, yeah. Chief, uh, what's it like uh, to be the career field manager? So I see that in your title there. Um, what's that job like, and, and what kind of job satisfaction do you have from that? Wow. Humbling. Uh, humbling. Uh, 22,000 active duty defenders, 48,000 uh, defenders, period, worldwide total force, and I get to be the enlisted uh face of that. Absolutely humbling. Uh, I work for a two-star, uh, General Tank Sherman, and uh, the two of us get to proudly lead, advocate, and try to provide pi uh, policy and guidance for the entire force. Uh, it is a big take. It is not one that is done by myself or by the general by himself. Uh, it takes a team. So we've got our MAGCOM teams, and we've got uh, uh, people uh, around the world that help us out with that, but a humbling experience. Uh, my biggest joys are probably uh, traveling to see our airmen, worldwide doing the J-O-B uh, and always keep in touch with them, never forgetting where you came from, never forgetting what it felt like to be on that post. And I will tell you, I say this whenever I have the opportunity. Uh, I try to uh, be the same person I was as a tech sergeant today and never forget that. And every decision that we make, uh, I think about how does it affect that operations superintendent at the squadron level? How does it affect that flight chief? And how does it affect Airman Gallagher posted on that main gate or on patrol or on that flight line or somewhere in harm's way? Uh, a humbling experience. Uh, proud to be the next person. Uh, proud to be the 20th career field manager for security forces. Uh, definitely wasn't a goal. Uh, wasn't anything I thought I would ever be doing, uh, but humbled to do so. But you asked me a question a minute ago about my proudest moment, uh, and then we jumped on to the other one. But I think it's important to touch on that. Uh, sure. It's not being Go the career it. field manager. It, it's not being uh, the voice of so many people. It's probably 2008, 2009 when Tex Arn Gallagher was in Iraq uh, doing the J-O-B as an outside the wire squad leader. Uh, having the lives of 13 people that I was responsible for, for their training, their, their care and feeding, and all the things that a non-commissioned officer is supposed to do. Most importantly, making sure that when we're in contact and in harm's way and doing the things that happen outside the wire, uh, during outside the wire operations is that every time I came back home with 13, that's what I hang my hat on. And to those people that didn't understand why I was hard on them when I was, why we were there an hour early, why we were there two hours late, why our vehicles were cleaned up, why our radios worked, why our weapons were clean, why all the mundane things that had to be done had to be done. It was to make sure that all 13 came home. So I'll hang my hat on that. Uh, clearly my proudest moments. Wow. That's cool. When stuff, I love listening to answers like that because I get chill bumps and just like, it just kind of re-blues me. You know, in the Air Force, we have this term called re-bluing and it's a little cheesy, I know, but uh, it's this thing where you get to experience something that makes you feel more part of what you are and the uniform that you wear. And it kind of helps you just get back in touch with what it's like to remember the reasons that you joined, remember the reasons that you wear that uniform. Uh, and that was definitely one of those. And I could feel the, the emotion coming through for that. Um, so thank you. Um, and I know that those guys, those 13, all thank you as well. So very much appreciated. Okay. So you've had a long career so far, uh, tons of experience, lots of, uh, opportunities for you. Uh, but give me one of your, let's say one of your more personal ones that might, might be less about necessarily the team. I know it's incredibly important to give credit where credit's due, but, uh, kick it back to like, I don't know, maybe even go back army days. Talk, walk me through uh, specialist Gallagher days. Uh, any fun stories, any, any shenanigans that we can talk about on air, you know, obviously. Um, but, uh, you know, give us, give us some of that stuff. Well, specialist Gallagher thought he knew everything and he thought he owned the world. Uh, stories that I could tell, they're probably not ready for prime time. This is a family show. <laughs> uh, but, uh, you know, I learned a lot. I learned, I was, I was young. I learned a lot about myself. Uh, honestly, I, I learned the importance of camaraderie, 
uh, from deployments in the Army, uh, from going everywhere from Somalia to serving in Egypt and the multinational force and observers thing. I learned the meaning of teamwork. Uh, I, I was fortunate my entire career, whether Air Force or Army, I, I have literally worked uh, for military rock stars. Uh, one of my squad leaders, a gentleman named Chuck Kirkland, he was the 43rd Regimental Sergeant Major for the Military Police Corps when he retired. Uh, I worked for him directly. Uh, huge, huge influence on me. Another Sergeant Major named Norm Hampton, who retired, huge on me. Uh, on the Air Force side of the house, uh, I got to work with other rock stars, you know, uh, Chief Master Sergeant Rick Parsons uh, at the A20th, later became the ACC Command Chief. Uh, Chief Master Sergeant Jay France, uh, later became the uh, Transcom Command Chief, had a huge impact on me. Uh, he impressed me in ways and taught me things he didn't even know he'd impress me with or taught me. Uh, I've just been so blessed. Uh, there's no real thing I can pin down. The days actually get blurred when you've been in uniform this long. But the thing and the theme on that is those people all cared about me. Uh, they all took care of me. Uh, they all taught me things that I needed to know, and they, they pulled me aside when I needed to be pulled aside. Uh, Master Sergeant Steve Lundy, the, the, the line is long uh, and, and distinguished. And the officers, too. I've worked with some rock star officers uh, through and through, and uh, I've just been very blessed. Uh, I'm one of the few people that can probably say there's very few people in uniform that I wasn't proud to serve with that really did the job to take care of me and teach me what right looked like when taking care of my own troops. Yeah, another great answer. Um, so let's kick this one a little bit more focused towards uh, our audience. What would you say um, as kind of like a bullet points, just the bare bones, what can you tell um, our interested potential applicants, people that might be looking at joining the Air Force and going security forces? Uh, what will that look like for them? What advice do you have for them? Bring a can-do mindset. Don't sell yourself short. Uh, things we're going to ask you to do in security forces, they're going to be hard. It may be some of the hardest things you've ever been done. Uh, I need you to grow a thick skin and we'll help you with that, right? This may be the first time in some people's career that they don't absolutely succeed at something, but that's okay because you've got a team that's going to pick you up and they're going to drag you across the finish line. That's what we do. Uh, we train people. Uh, we take care of people. And the way we do that is through repetition, repetition, and repetition. Some of the things you're going to do are going to be what you feel to be mundane. Uh, they're going to be very physical. Uh, you're going to be dirty. You're going to be sweaty. Uh, we're going to take you down to Texas just to make sure that it's dirty and hot and sweaty. And we're going to drag <laughs> you through the mud like it's probably never happened before, just getting you ready for what lies ahead. We need to build a resilient person ready to get after it, knowing full well that your job exists for one reason and one reason only, and that is the protection of resources, people, and warfighting assets so we can do our mission and project our power anywhere around the world 24 hours a day. And it's to get you in the mindset to be able to do that. It's not easy. I want you to challenge yourself, and I, know I want you to come knowing this is going to be hard. If anybody's out there telling you it's easy, nothing that's worth having comes easy but you're not gonna do it alone. You're gonna be a lot of people there. I didn't get here by myself. People wanted to see me succeed and that's why I'm here. And that's what the rest of Defender Nation is gonna do for you when you get that opportunity. Nice. I was about to ask a question about what that's like going through the training pipeline and going through the education stuff where you learn to do the job uh, and what it's like to have those guys and girls on your left and right helping you through that process. And then you just said Defender Nation and that kind of wraps that all together. Um, I know as a, as a military member, um, we kind of automatically have that bond, right? And no matter what your career field is, you've got to go through that training element and you bond with the people around you. But I can imagine with the additional stressors and the additional requirements, the things that are asked of you um, as you're learning to become a defender and as you're a young defender, uh, talk to me about how important that team is and maybe an experience from your end. Hey, that team is everything. And I tell you, you got me all fired up. You started talking about training. That's been like my, my whole career's thing is, is training. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that basic defender course, right? Uh, mm -hmm. It's changed and it's new and it's tough. It's supposed to be. And it, it is all about learning the basic, about being brilliant at the basics, honestly. So we're going to test you. This is going to be harder than basic military training. I'm just letting you know when you get in the pipeline, this is not going to be easy. But we're going to teach you in a way that's going to make sense, right? We're going to crawl, walk, and then we're going to run. 
you're going to come in and you're going to qualify with your weapon systems. All the weapon systems the security forces fires, you will fire. You may not qualify with the heavy machine guns and whatnot, but you will fire those weapon systems. So you'll be familiar with them, familiar with the grenade launchers and things of that nature as well. But we're going to teach you individual skills. Then we're going to collectively build you up into fire teams, and you're going to learn those fire team skills. All right, then we're going to put that into a squad and into a flight, and we're going to do this over and over and over again. You're going to learn how to do, like I said, mounted patrols, dismounted patrols, how to operate as members of these fire teams. And we're going to put everything together at the end in a big field training exercise at a Camp Bullis, and we're going to put you to the test. You will fight an enemy. You will do those things. Then you're going to do a ruck march. You're going to do several ruck marches while you're there, and then you'll graduate the next day. But you're going to do 30 13 weeks of that. But to me, one of the biggest things is you're not only going to qualify, you're going to do proficiency fire three different times throughout that, uh, throughout that course. And the best part about that is you're probably going to fire more rounds in your tech school than most of our six-year enlistees fired during their first enlistment. That is the dedication we're putting behind firing and running with those weapon systems, okay? Because at the end of the day, uh, those that know me have heard this too many times, at the end of the day, the only force in the United States military that is running around every single day, 24-7, with a loaded weapon, one in the pipe, and on fire is security forces. So if you're going to do that, you better be comfortable with that weapon system, being safe with it and knowing if you ever have to use it, you're going to relinquish that target at the other end of the barrel. Love it. Absolutely love it. All right. It is that time of the show where we get into the back and forth section where we answer questions from you on the Internet at large live here on the show. Make sure you're putting in those questions in the comments section. Put a cue before it so we know which ones are questions. And just as a reminder, all of the recruiting based questions, we've actually got dedicated people inside the chats that will be answering those questions. So watch for our answers coming from. Uh, Pam and Ray, uh, and make sure that you're engaging with those guys because they're going to help you with all your recruiting stuff because we've got really just solid answers coming from them. Um, but while we're here on the show, we're going to focus on things security forces. Uh, and so we're going to get into that part of the show. Um, as well as the security forces question and answer section, we've actually got another guest that we're going to bring on the show as well. We have got Colonel Metzger joining us as well. Uh, he's going to help us get some of those higher level answers and make sure that me and the chief are getting everything straight. Isn't that right, sir? Yeah. Might be the other way around, but thank you. Appreciate the time and opportunity to be on the show. Absolutely. Absolutely. Glad to have you here. And uh, we're happy to see that uh, your connection stayed stable. And uh, maybe if we yeah. get a chance, we can kick over to the other side of the room. I know you had some uh, some uh, trophies back up on the wall over there that I maybe do. we'll yeah, get to I later. Do, yeah. Maybe we'll yep, get to later. Don't touch good. the computer. You don't want anything to go off. Roger, don't anything, do it. So, all right, perfect. Sounds good. So, uh, question for you: um, If I'm sitting at home and I'm thinking security forces sounds like a pretty good gig, and after some of the conversations that Chief and I have had over the past twenty minutes, I mean, it sounded like a pretty good gig. Uh, I'm getting That's fired back true. up. You know, it was always an option uh, to be security forces, and every once in a while, we find ourselves wondering why we didn't why we didn't pull that trigger. Um, if I'm sitting at home and I'm thinking, I'm watching the show, I want to be security forces and I'm thinking about joining, why do you think someone should, to, should join security forces now today? That's a really good question. Um, yeah. And I would say that listening to the chief, that is nothing more than you, only other way to describe that is exciting. And what he was talking about is, are things and environments and emotions that we all share. You know, you heard the chief talk about, uh, the defender family, defender nation. And that's really what it is. There's so many opportunity to do things. And so, so much so that the chief was one of the guys that raised me up, right? So he and I spent mm. some quality time in some not so fun places. And uh, he, he was able to keep me out of trouble and keep me on the right path. And, and it's not just about the leadership from, from the officer's side into the enlisted corps, but it's also from the enlisted corps into the officer's side. And he did a really good job of that. Uh, but why would you join the security forces today? Uh, I, I'd say re replay what the chief said. There's so much opportunity out there for us to take part in defending the country, taking care of people and leading in every different aspect that there's really no other career field that's, that, that, that can do that except for us. So uh, it really, I, I would just echo the chief's words and say, giddy up after that. All right. 
Well, when we jump into the questions and answers section, which we're going to do here shortly, uh, we have a tendency to burn through the rest of the show really, really fast because it gets it gets fast paced. We get moving pretty quickly. Uh, stories come out and a lot of, you know, just a lot of like autonomous conversation happens. So before we do that, I'm going to ask you if you've got any shout outs, any specific people that you want to say hi to. And also, what is the lasting thing? Like, what is that one thing that you wish you could impart to the younger version of you who might be parallel to someone who's potentially looking at this career choice? What you got for us? Who, who's that directed to, me or Chief? That's, that's directed toward you, sir. Okay. Uh, so what would I tell the younger me? Settle down, weirdo. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, I, I think when, when I look back, you know, I, I have 23 years in as well. You look back and, and, the, and the career field is just a blur, like the chief said. We d we've done so many things, and the chief and I have been so many places together. Um, you really wonder where it all went, and, and could, could you go back and replay them? And the idea would just be slow down. Uh, we were, like we said, we were in some places that weren't very nice, and, and, and we may have gotten close in a bunker together because somebody didn't like us, uh, but we leaned on each other. And those are the experiences that, that grow us as a family and make sure that no matter who's sitting beside you, they are your family and you will do whatever it takes to defend them as well. So I, I would tell myself to settle down and, 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 and enjoy the moments that I had. Um, and I forget the first part of your question. What was the first part? No, that's all right. The first part was just shout outs. Um, I gave, I gave Chief uh, plenty of time to give his shout outs to people that, uh, you know, that oh. he wanted to, to recognize. So I want to make sure yeah, I do him. the same service before we get into the question and answer. There you go. There you go. Yeah, he was he was one of them. Uh, and 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 Master Sergeant Jay France was another one. It was Tech Sergeant Gallagher. I was Captain Metzger. Um, but I mean, we've all got we've got we've got officers that that led me along the way, right? And yep. and a lot of those officers are in security forces. And there's a lot of officers that, like you said, there's a bond in the family just because we're in the military. I had some officers outside the career field that led me in in, in the path as well. Gotcha. Gotcha. All right. Well, let's get to the question and answers. We'll throw one up on the screen, read it, and uh, we'll figure out who's best to answer. Let's see what we got. Uh, let's see. Ty says, is a driver's <laughs> license needed in order to become part of the security forces? Chief, what you got? Yep. Yeah. So this is a hot button topic, right? Uh, it is. Uh, you, you've got to show up at your duty station with a driver's license because I, I need you to understand that when you show up and if anything goes on in an installation, I mean, we can't use the term first responder if we got to call an Uber to get there. Right. So I need you to have that <laughs> driver's license right away. Uh, the other piece of that is if you're up in the uh, nuclear enterprise up in the wilds of Montana, Wyoming and the Dakotas, when you show up, you've got to be a contributing member of that team and be able to drive when you show up. Now, in all honesty, we're looking at this for the recruiting command. And if someone can find an answer of to where that training would take care, uh, take place, uh, you need to be able to show up at your first duty station. If we can work that out somehow, uh, we'll, we'll make that work. Because I do understand that there's a, a group of people out there that may not have driver's license. And we get that from a lot of our metropolitan areas and whatnot that have public transportation. Uh, so we need to work on that. And the other thing is when you do go to tech school, I mentioned mounted patrolling. Uh, that's that's more than patrol vehicles. That's also tactical vehicles and things of that nature as well. So yes, we do need you licensed, but it is something that we are working with and we may have a different answer in, in, in a short time. All right, great answer. Let's do another one. What are the requirements and what's the process to become a Raven in security forces? Colonel, what you got for this one? Yeah, so Raven School is a, uh, it's, I think it's a three-week course now. It was 23 years ago. Uh, but really, when you go to Raven School, um, we take what we teach you in, in security forces and base defense, and we just ratchet it up a notch, and we make you uh, a, a little bit better when it comes time to operate in a small team tactical environment, understanding how to secure an, air, an airframe and maybe an austere environment when there's nobody else around and it's you and your buddy. Uh, so the, the training is uh, done at Fort Dix in New Jersey, and um, it's really it's a really good opportunity to, to enhance your skill. And then they get to go, as we spoke in the beginning part of the show, they get to go uh, to some really cool places with the airframes to make sure that the uh, the asset is secure, the people are secure, and all of the all of the um, 
all the weapons and um, equipment is, is safe. What would you say if you could summarize what a Raven is from a traditional security forces member? Like if there was like a title or like a quick description, what sets a Raven apart from being just a normal defender? I say normal, but just a defender who's not a Raven. Thank you. Well, I, it's, there, there's a there's a gentleman named Lieutenant Colonel Dave Nugent that's listening to this right now who is dying to hear this answer. Um, well, let's not let him uh, down. <laughs> yeah, right. So uh, there is what makes the Raven different. What is what sets them apart? Well, one of the things they get is a tab. So uh, you would see on the chief's uniform, he has a sniper tab. Uh, a, ra a Raven would wear a Raven tab. And what sets them apart is is the next level training. Um, you, you can easily recognize them uh, by the tab. Uh, they don't look any different than the rest of the defenders out there, but they may perform a little different when, when it comes to small unit tactics. Gotcha. Pretty solid. I've answer. got an add on for that. Can I add on? Absolutely, Chief. Go ahead. We don't put just anybody at the bottom of the stairs of Air Force One when the president travels. That right there is enough to say it all. I mean, if I asked for a short, concise answer, that one, that was it. All right, no, Chief. He beat. We have to cut his mic off. He's making he's making us sound like we don't read and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Man, he's got them solid answers. All right, let's get another one up there. Is it possible to obtain a waiver for being older than 44 to join as a security forces member? Well, I, mean, I'll, I can take this that, one. That, yes, it's, it's yeah, possible. I, Go ahead, sir. And he's got a PhD, so I'm really looking at that guy to be an officer. Um, right. So if I don't know the answer to the question, but if the question, if the answer to the question is yes, then I need you to be an officer. So the answer to that question is talk to your recruiter. Um, waivers operate outside of the norm, right? Where we can take into consideration a bunch of other things particular to your situation that may make a difference on whether or not the Air Force is willing to consider you as an applicant outside of what we would normally consider. Uh, and while 44 is outside that number, um, talk to a recruiter, let them know what you bring to the table. Um, and if you can't find a recruiter, go on airforce.com, use the recruiter locator tool. It's super simple. You punch in your zip code. It shows literally every single recruiter that's around you. You can select officer recruiting, which like the Colonel was saying, check out officer recruiting. Cause if you do indeed have that PhD, we would love to have more doctorate holding, uh, officers in the, uh, in the air force, specifically in special or in, uh, security forces. So uh, talk to a recruiter. Airforce.com is a great, a great resource for that. So uh, yes, to answer your question. Yeah, I'm sure there is a way to waiver it as long as the Air Force deems it appropriate. All right. How can you become a military working dog handler? I knew this one was coming because people love dogs. <laughs> and what's the training like and how long does it last? Uh, Chief, why don't you take this one away? Yeah, absolutely. So first of all, you're going to go through the basic defender course. Uh, once you get to your first duty station, you've been there for one year and you've done your five level upgrade training. OK, uh, once you have done that, then you're eligible to apply to become a military working dog handler. And when you do that, we ask for a return on investment right now of three years for a first term enlistee. That is no longer considered a retrain. We used to consider that your first term retrain. So if you came into security forces and for some reason you didn't like what you were doing, um, you have the opportunity as a first term airman to try a different career field. In the past, if you joined MWD, Military Working Dog Handler, or Combat Arms, that counted as your first term retrain. That is no longer the truth. We recently just changed policy on that because honestly, it's been kind of a bait and switch because once you're done being a dog handler, we're going to send you right back to security forces to do that job. So that's what it takes to get in. We want to get you trained up to do it. And we're about to take a whole new relook at what military working dogs look like and and, and think about some things like can you PCS with your dog and and some some other items that help the bonding between the handler and the canine themselves. Yep. I've actually been to the kennels over on Lackland. And uh, anytime, that's the most recent experience I've had with the military working dog handlers. And uh, I can tell you that it's really cool to see like the contact, the, the bond between someone and their dog is pretty special. Uh, I will say that watching the bond between uh, a security forces member and their dog is if you're not a dog owner or a dog person, it's enough to make you one. <laughs> it's pretty incredible. It's pretty special to watch. And I know uh, that some of those changes like that would be definitely something that'll have their attention. So definitely something to keep an eye on. 
All right. What grade score do I have to get on the ASVAB for security forces to become a defender? Either one of you guys know the cutoff score for that? I do. I do. I know the cutoff score. This is always a thing of contention, right? Uh, there, there's getting in the door, and then there's what the career field average is. So getting in the door is 33. Uh, that's not too hard to obtain, to be honest with you. And our career field average is 65. So we're doing actually pretty well overall, but that's what it takes to come in and be a security forces member. Gotcha. That's the threshold. Uh, like you said, it doesn't take a whole lot to, to make over that. Uh, just make sure you brush up and and do your mind stretching skills and just stay sharp. Uh, the ASVAB is pretty generalized stuff. I was military police officer in Brazil for almost 10 years. Is there any possibility that I'll join the Air Force as security forces? By the way, love this show. Thank you very much. We like the show too, and I'm glad to hear that you guys like it. But uh, unless you guys have specifics on stuff like that, um, what, uh, what, kind of, what kind of things have you seen when it comes to international experience? Someone with uh, any kind of law enforcement experience outside the United States? I, I haven't run across anyone. The biggest thing I've run across is inter-service transfers from the Army, the Marine Corps over to security forces. And, and right now with our paradigm shift in training, uh, we're actually looking now at 11 Bravos on the Army side of the house. That's infantryman skills uh, to bring over and possibly cross-train directly over. But as far as uh, other nations, I, I personally haven't run into that. I know there are considerations, um, and I am not a recruiter, so I can't answer this one with 100% uh, confidence, but I know that as long as you have uh, U.S. citizenship uh, and you are eligible to join the Air Force, uh, that background experience is something you're going to want to talk to a recruiter about, let them know what experiences you have, because that is a serious consideration. Something to keep in mind is when you talk to a recruiter about joining the Air Force, if you have a specific job in mind that you want to do and you have experience that has relevance to that, it's a huge thing for you. That really helps the Air Force out say, okay, this person actually has some experience here. We can lean on that experience and help them do what's best for not the Air Force, but also the individual. So talk to a recruiter. They're going to have your best answers. Uh, and airforce.com is a great place to find that stuff. I'd like to learn about Security Forces Commission Officer career. Would someone be willing to share with me about it? Well, if we only had a commissioned officer <laughs> that was security forces on the call. Oh, hey, Colonel, yeah. uh, you want to you wanna share? Yeah, so I kind of expected this question to come online. Um, uh, your career starts out uh, as an officer doing a lot of what you heard the chief talking about. The basic officer course is where you will go. It's uh, roughly just under four months of training. Um, and once you graduate from, from the basic officer course, uh, we'll send you off to our first, uh, <laughs> it's a long time. We'll send you off to the first base. Um, and, uh, you're going to be a Lieutenant and you're going to be on flight doing a lot of the things that the chief described. There's some drawbacks, uh, that some might, might consider a drawback to being an officer where you don't get to be a military working dog handler. You don't get to be a combat arms instructor. Um, but you do get to lead a lot of airmen early on in your career. As soon as you're a second lieutenant, you're going to start leading troops on a flight level anywhere from 10 to, I had 72 as a second lieutenant wow. at um, our Air Force Base, day one of my Air Force career. Uh, and, and you'll do that flight level stuff for a little while. You go on and be an operations officer after that, and then we're going to set you up for squadron command. Uh, you'll be able to lead an organization with the chief at your side as a teammate. Um, and you, you'll do that a couple of times. Uh, you'll get an opportunity to work on the air staff. You'll get an opportunity to work in the joint staff. Um, and then after that, we'll, we'll set you up for group command. And then you'll be leading organizations that include a security forces squadron and a logistics readiness squadron and a force support squadron as a group commander. And then uh, after that, uh, depending on how well your performance has gone over the past 20 or so years, depends on whether or not you'll be uh, set up well to be a wing commander um, and, and then general officer after that. Wow. So, okay. So every time, one of the things I love about having uh, commission officers on this show is my experience yeah. has been strictly enlisted uh, and I love learning and hearing those answers, but the difference sounds uh, mirrored in the same aspect that there's a ton of opportunities uh, but it really looks like those opportunities are pointed toward a slightly more uh, leadership roles um, and really shaping 
what the force looks like and leading larger groups of people. Uh, and it looks like those opportunities come with like, some of those names you were throwing out, with some pretty high caliber positions as well. So definitely something to look into if leadership is your strong suit. Um, all right, so Chief, you talked about training the next person to replace you. What's the best training and development tools or courses that we have for security forces and CEOs? That dude has an Instagram picture or a uh, LinkedIn picture with a bunch of uniforms. Uh, and that was a very well phrased question. He capitalized NCO. I'm guessing this one's going to a, to a, a uniform member for sure. So take it, take it. Chief. So, uh, so I'll be honest with you. Uh, we just redesigned the entire training pipeline. So right now I would tell you, uh, Obviously, you've got your professional military education. The Air Force is going to require you to go to ALS and whatnot, uh, the uh, NCO Academy, Senior NCO Academy. But for security forces as a whole, uh, we relaunched what's called the Combat Leaders Course. It's that small unit training to teach you to be the best fire team leader and squad leader that you can become. Uh, it was it was put on the shelf a couple of years back. We brought it back, revamped all of the uh, curriculum, and honestly, we made it pretty gangster. It is tough. Uh, people fail, they go home because they fail, but they get the opportunity to come back. It's one of those courses where it is designed to be extremely tough, put you under pressure, put you into an environment where you have to make decisions that you're not normally comfortable with. Uh, and, and that's one of the things we got to get used to is that people are allowed to go to this course. They are allowed to fail. We will pick you up. We will dust you off. We will get you rehabbed and back into the fight. But that is our first course. And I think it's really crucial that our, that our NCOs go to that because arguably since about 2015, some of our downrange reps and our ops tempo has slowed down a little bit. So we don't have as many uh, NCOs and middle tier NCOs and young senior NCOs that might have got those downrange repetitions that we once did. So we've got to th create through uh, artificial means such as training. That's one of them. The other one is IDC3, which is a uh, uh, integrated Defense Command and Control course, and basically what that is is how to employ our defenders in the field, how you do that perimeter defense, whether it's a, a tight squad 360 or your base's perimeter, how you're going to secure that, not only downrange, but at home station as well. And it's about weapons capabilities, personnel capabilities, uh, and how you would set up your force protection footprint in your base security zone. Uh, so that's a big deal because that's about employment. It's about how are you going to use that squadron full of defenders to defend that patch of land that you're on. Uh, those are the two right now. Uh, the others are just getting reps, 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 and more reps, and then taking every single opportunity you have to do something different. Uh, if you've got an opportunity to go to one of the CRGs or the base defense group, if you got the opportunity to try the tactical response force or combat, uh, combat resp uh, convoy response force up in the nuclear world, go do those things. If you have the opportunity to go be an instructor at one of the RTCs, I would encourage you to go do that as well. Those are all things you can do to sharpen your sword and be more ready to be a, a great leader. A lot of, lot of choices. Definitely a lot of things to, to get after as far as additional training. I think it's really important that you mentioned um, failure in training. And that's not something to be afraid of because we'll learn more about ourselves, the process, and how to get better every time we fail in a process in a system like that. So uh, it's definitely not a bad thing. Is it a good job if you're married with two kids or a single father with two kids? Uh, I don't know if it's a comparison question, um, but uh, if either of you have experience being a parent, um, whether that was single or otherwise, I will offer that question to you. Yeah, I'm married with two kids right now. <laughs> there you go. Sounds like we got a we got a subject matter expert on our hands. And my wife is uh, is in the Air National Guard, um, so we are it's we're a we're a uh, Air Force family. Um, it's there you go. Yeah, we're an Air Force family, and, and and we figure out how to how to make that happen. My wife needs to uh, go TDY as much as I do, um, and we figure out how to take care of our family. We always put family first. Um, sometimes that means this family. Sometimes that means my two little munchkins run around upstairs. Um, and and but all of the while, we are figuring out ways to make you successful and take care of your family. At no point do we ever want to divide those because it, th let's be honest, if you're, if you're unable, if you're at work thinking about your family, you're not, not worried about what's going on uh, in the defense of our nation. And that's not a good thing. For sure. I can't speak personally about experiences in security forces, um, but I do know that it's a pretty consistent brand across the Air Force that the 
as long as you're communicating with the people around you, your chain of command and the people who are responsible for you, uh, if there's something you got to take care of on the home front, a lot of times the facilitation is the flexibility that's allowed to you to be able to take care of those things because they know better than anybody else. If you're busy thinking about something that's stressing you out at home, you're not going to be able to be 100% at work and they need you 100% at work. So uh, when it comes to being able to take care of your family, Air Force pretty dang accom accommodating for sure. Is there a process to become a law enforcement officer or anything else? Do I have to do gate duty for a certain amount of time until I can be an LEO? Chief, what you got for this one? Yeah, so there's no requirement for, for gate duty on how you become a law enforcement officer. Right now, it's going to be based upon the installation you go to, honestly, and their mission. Uh, I would say we're probably more law and order than we are law enforcement. Uh, depending on what installation you're in, it's going to depend on how that goes. Uh, we have some uh, jurisdictions where we have a federal magistrate. If we do, that's where you would write federal and state tickets and do law enforcement in that mode. Otherwise, if you're not, uh, you're in a position where you may be the first responder, but you're probably going to turn that law enforcement experience over to the local law enforcement authorities. Otherwise, we deal with people and turn them over to the units for non-judicial punishment. So in many cases, we're kind of a catch and release organization. Uh, we are working right now on the professionalization of our law enforcement uh, capabilities, if you will. Uh, but it's not on a tactical pause uh, but we're waiting to see what comes out of this building in the next two weeks and what the Air Force tells us. Security forces, this is what you're going to look like. Uh, these are the capabilities that we're going to want you to perform uh, before we go any further. So we're kind of in a, like a, a tactical timeout, if you will, to see what that looks like, and then we'll c continue to pursue. Uh, we do have a plan, but I don't want to get out in front of my boss or anyone else until I hear the table slapped on what the overall direction of the career field is going to be. Copy that. Good stuff. And uh, you say in that building, what building are you in? <laughs> uh, that building would be the five-sided one uh, on the uh, uh, northern section of Washington, D.C. Uh, myself and Colonel Metzger, is, he's the officer career field manager. I'm the enlisted career field manager, and we both work with the director out of the Pentagon. Yeah, so y'all hear that out there, right? So if you're getting answers, your questions answered right now on this show, uh, you're, you're talking to two gentlemen who are literally in the Pentagon. So we're talking to the Pentagon. That's pretty sweet. Okay, cool. So this next question, will security forces have a peace post? That's peace officer station training? Is that right? Stand. Uh, it's, Stand. Uh, it's police officer standardized training, standardization standardized training. Standardized training. Okay. So here's what we're working on. It's not that security forces will have the post certification. The Department of Defense has a commission right now. Uh, and that was part of the plan I was just speaking about is how do we get after the post certification piece? Uh, we do have a post certified academy. Uh, we work hand in hand with VA Letsy, uh, the Veterans Administration Law Enforcement Training Center. Uh, and that is where our post certified officers will go to. We're only going to require about five to 7,000 of those members by estimate out of our 22,000 active duty members to actually go do this. But once you do do it, you will be federally post accredited. And what we're working on is the details right now, because if we do this and you get that federal post accreditation, I want to get a return investment out of those that we get trained. What I can allow to happen is have security forces be the largest uh, federally post-certified uh, academies that are out there to help the rest of our three-letter agencies in the United States government. We have to be healthy, but we need a return on investment once you get trained. So we're going to be very selective about that, but that is something that is coming in the near future. Sure. That makes sense. All right. Next one. Does security forces training carry over to civilian law enforcement after military service? Colonel, I'm pretty sure yeah. we can all have the same answer for this one. Yeah, without a doubt, yes. Um, uh, the training that you go through is e equally translatable into the law enforcement community. Um, but, but I will say, echoing what the chief just mentioned, uh, what we don't want to do is create an environment where we are bringing in people, training them only for them to go out and, and, and fill local law enforcement agencies around the country. The idea is for us to provide training for you that makes you a quality defender and keep you around. The Air Force needs good leadership. The Air Force needs good people to stand in harm's way and, and, and take care of problems when they arise. And so we're gonna deliver that training to you. We're gonna make you an effective leader and we're gonna, we're gonna keep you, hopefully keep you around for a little while so that uh, we, we, we can grow you up to be the next Chief Mass Sergeant Gallagher. Gotcha. And it sounds like from the experiences that I'm hearing from both of you, 
that uh, you've both been pretty satisfied with your careers. So it's not a bad call if you join uh, with the objective not to necessarily take that training and jump back out to the civilian side. It sounds like there are definite perks to, uh, to staying in. Uh, my son's first week of security forces tech school this week, he wants to go career as a detective canine and dagger. Any advice I can relate to him? And this will be our last question of the show. All right, I guess so I'll take that one since that's a, that's a clearly enlisted question. There you go. Uh, first yeah. of all, congratulations, and I, I, I wish your son the best of success. Uh, the first thing is, uh, the first advice I've got to him is concentrate on being the absolute best at what you're doing right now. Let's get you to that pipeline first and foremost. Once you do that, and once we get you off to your first duty station, wherever that may be worldwide, will help determine the next step because you've got to get to us. You got, we got to get you out to the tribe. We got to get you trained up on that particular installation and get you trained in your upgrade training. Uh, once that's done, sir, that's going to open the door for him to be able to pursue uh, other options. Uh, canine would probably come quicker than investigations would. That's going to be one that's going to require uh, uh, them to be in a little bit, get some reps underneath their belt, kind of in a place that's got a little bit of a law enforcement flavor to it before we send them off to investigations. Uh, canine's a little different. Uh, if they're doing, if he's doing all the things that he needs to do within that year, he can apply to be an MWD handler, which I'm short of right now. Uh, so that's a great possibility to be able to do that. Uh, Dagger, Dagger is basically going to be based on duty station. He's going to need to go to an Air Force Special Operations Command base, of which we only have two, Herbert Field in Florida and Cannon Air Force Base in New Mexico. Uh, one of those, well, more than one of those, those, both of those opportunities, if they're doing the things they need to do in a very highly competitive environment, uh, will allow them to go to the Dagger course, okay? And that's deployed air ground response elements, and that helps Special Operations Command with the things they're doing and securing during their operations. Uh, very competitive. So if he's doing all the things that he needs to do, uh, he's competitive type A by nature, he's going to have that opportunity to compete and to go to that school. That's a very difficult school to get to, a very difficult school to complete, uh, but always a possibility just based on where the mindset's in and, and how strongly that he wants to do that. Awesome. Solid answers all the way around. Uh, I want to take a moment and thank both of you for taking time out of your incredibly busy schedules. I know you all are very important. you got a lot of work to do. Uh, I mean, you're at the top of, of the food chain when it comes to everyone who's tuning into this show, whether they're already a defender, they're already in, or they're looking at potentially making a career move to become a defender in the Air Force. So thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for your wealth of knowledge and all the experience you've brought. I know the audience has appreciated it. We can see it in the comments. There's tons of love coming through. Uh, and thank you to all the defenders out there doing their jobs, uh, you know, every cool. single day, taking care of the mission, making sure that we're safe on base, off base, downrange, and, and here in the States. Uh, one last question before we go. What can we do to the defenders that we come in contact with every single day to say thank you other than just saying thank you? Is there anything, like, special that we can do? I know, like, they cool. just appreciate it when I come through and tell them to say, you know, stay warm. That's just no, that's don't <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so just, I'll go just with a, just what the genuine... boss said. Yep. Don't tell them to stay warm and don't feed the animals. Don't bring food to the gate. Honestly, folks, it's a force protection issue. Hey, nothing against you, but if it's not a packaged <laughs> product that is sealed, anybody could come up go. and feed anything to our airmen at any time. So seriously, don't sense. bring food to the gate. That makes sense. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you to everybody else out there for joining us. Um, we would not be able to be here uh, and put this show on if y'all didn't keep coming back into the comments, showing us love and making sure that we have somebody to keep talking to. Uh, so that being said, we are going to I'm in the middle, <laughs> was in the middle of it, waving me down. Um, so uh, moving forward, we're going to keep going with this kind of format. I uh, hope you guys love it as much as we do. Uh, and I want you guys to join us. Go check out airforce.com. Make sure that you tune into the show. Next show is going to be February 27th, and we are going to be doing all things Space Force. And there is a rumor out there that I'm going to get my very own Space Force polo for that one. So stay tuned. <laughs> we will see you there. Thanks, everybody. We hope that you enjoyed this episode of The Back and Forth brought to you by Headquarters Air Force Recruiting Service. It is a privilege for us to bring you all the information and insider insight into the exciting world of the United States Air Force. Remember, this show is all about you. We want to make sure we're providing you information and answers you need to make an informed decision about your future. 
So make sure to join us every other Tuesday with your questions, your feedback, and any ideas you have for future episodes. We are all ears. Don't forget to subscribe to our social media channels for even more exciting content. And also visit AfWords.com for all the latest information on serving as a Total Force Airman. And with that, until next time, aim high.